What do you do with your miniatures games when they stop being supported? Do you still play them? Well, I think we should. Welcome to Corner Case. You're in the hobby corner. I'm your host, your tabletop Indiana Jones, and your best friend, Deck. Before I forget, I want to shout out folks over at our Discord community, specifically Coyote BD, for discussing this topic with me, also on his YouTube at Coyote BD. So, I've got a problem. These are my Guild Ball Fishermen. Now, I love Guild Ball and I love these fishermen, but this game is dead. Now, obviously, if y'all got the kickoff box, this is not a problem for you, but that is a unique case. Don't get hung up on it. This video is about what to do with dead miniatures games in general. I just happen to be using my Guild Ball Fisherman for this example right now. I think most dead miniatures games end up like this, kind of just like a cool pile of toys that by themselves don't add up to a full experience. Well, I think we can learn from our sister hobby here. Yes, that is board games. When you open up a board game, you get everything you need right out of the box. You get rules, you get minis, tokens, cards, your board, your playset, you know, if you need any measuring tools, absolutely everything. A mentor of mine once told me, and I think they're quoting John Hodgman here, and I'm passing this quote on to you. The difference between hoarding and collecting is organization and presentation. Now, granted, sometimes this organization and presentation still get super big, but it's a lot better than the pile. So wouldn't it be nice if your minis were packaged, the whole game experience of, let's say, Guild Ball was packaged nicely even after the game is dead? Like, what if I meet someone in the future who's actually down to play Guild Ball with me? They've never played before, you know, so I would need at least two factions. I would need rules. I would need, like, the game state, like, the rules state and balance to be frozen in a spot that I like. In Guild Ball, this is Seasons, so should my frozen in time Guild Ball board game be frozen at Season 1 or 2 or 3 or 4? This is a really tough decision to make on your own, especially if you're not intimate with the game system or you're not intimate with it anymore because, like me, you're thinking about this years after the game died. For Guild Ball specifically, we're lucky that we have Haralt as a part of our Discord community, and they have been working with the community-led development of Guild Ball Season 4.5. So we have a resource there to kind of help us manage what we want to do. So the process of freezing this Guild Ball board game experience, I have my fishermen. As it happens, I have these two starter boxes of uh, butchers, and I have my resource for how to manage where I want the rules frozen. Maybe I'm lucky, maybe in season 4.5, because the community has been working on it, maybe butchers and fish are actually like in a good game state, like balance-wise, and we can just run with 4.5. No need to go back to any prior season. That would be easy peasy. Next, I would just need a board. I would probably like 3D print tokens and then dice and then put all that nicely in a box and boom, we are frozen in time and we can play this capsule of a Guild Ball experience in the future, maybe with this hy hypothetical person who would want to do that with me. <laughs> Obviously, uh, this isn't a hobby video. I'm not in process of doing this in front of you right now. I am chipping away at it though. I want to do this exact same thing with like X-Wing. Now that game isn't dead, but I definitely don't play enough to justify like an almost complete collection of Imperials and Rebels. I think I would probably want to freeze X-Wing at like X-Wing 1.0 up to like maybe Wave 5. You know, like Wave 5 was like Decimator and like like Dash Rendar. Soon Tier Fell was like still pretty decent, you know. And then we just like wouldn't tell whoever wanted to play with us about TLTs if they've never played X-Wing before, you know. So I think very quickly we start to realize that there can be a second life for these dead games. With just like a little time and a little love, we can preserve the experience in a nice package that we can then play with somebody who wasn't around the first time. And I think what I've learned from video game culture is at the time, in the moment, you're always looking towards that arms race of like bigger and better, you know, your, your, your Game Boy Color, then your Game Boy Advance, you know, like there's always an advancement in like the technology of the game. And you're always chasing that in the moment, but in the future, you always kind of like fall back on classics that you like, regardless of those updates. Like I'll still go back and play like Super Nintendo, N64, PS1, Game Boy Advance games, because like I grew up on that, 
you know, even though there are so many good games now, I'll still want to relive that experience. And I foresee that same thing in tabletop games. I definitely see it amongst like the Warhammer Fantasy Battle guys, like the, the Mordheim guys. You know, if you watch Guerrilla Miniatures games, like <laughs> that whole channel is just this. Like, all right, how are we going to play Mordheim again today? How are we going to play uh, Battlefleet Gothic again today? You know, so I think there is like a pretty big merit to preserving our games in a way that we can play with someone who wasn't around the first time. I think in the future we'll also potentially have less of this problem and the reason I think that is I think Kickstarter is really starting to break the mold of what we expect a miniatures game is. I think the reason for that is because in order to sell these miniatures games they actually have to improve the product experience. If you look at the way miniatures games are currently sold, I have to say that as a product experience they're really not very good. They sell you this product that is in bits and pieces and you you, you don't get a full product experience by just buying one box. They're starting to improve that with, with core sets, but the core sets can be very, very expensive. You know, and, and not only that, but you have to assemble the product yourself and after you've built the product and painted the the product then you have no recourse as to what to do with it when you're not playing with it do you just leave it on display on a shelf how do you bring it from place to place the first party game companies really don't manage that but the Kickstarter games they're putting everything into a nice box or boxes they have to be sensitive to this experience and I think that's actually changing the metagame here I have the examples of both God tier and Omicron Protocol. These are two games that I like. I consider them miniatures games. They actually play very well and, and they come in their boxes. They store very well in their boxes. I think one barrier that keeps traditional miniatures gamers away from this board game-like experience, well, I think there's a few things. First, I think there's like kind of a perceived if you're in a miniatures game as a hobby, you're like a more hardcore gamer, more hardcore hobbyist versus like the board game guys could be like more more like chill, you know, or they're like not not as cool as you. There's like an elitism, I guess, to like miniatures games. But I think that's definitely not the case anymore. That's definitely not the case. The other thing I think is Miniatures games really prioritize an immersive experience and fitting terrain and a big board into a box isn't easy. I think a defining characteristic of miniatures games is that realistic world, whereas board games are more willing to abstract the world into, into bite-sized pieces. Wargaming takes the whole thing and it wants to give you the whole ass world in one experience. And I think that is probably one of the bigger barriers. The examples that we've talked about so far, Guild Ball, X-Wing, Omicron Protocol, uh, God Tier, those are all games that require, you know, three by three board max and they, they use like 2D terrain. So, you know, you can stand on a box in Guild Ball or X-Wing, you fly over the asteroid. So you have these like flat pieces, which I would argue is like slightly less immersive experience. But that's where I point you to things like, um, I think they're called Tinker Terrain or more specifically, like you could look at Infinity. Again, I just ordered Blackwind, right? And they come, this is, you know, half, the box comes with half a full table's worth of terrain and it's all flat packed. So there is a way to do it so that you can get a flat pack experience. You can get a full terrain experience in a cardboard box. I think these are very good options that should be considered when uh, preserving a board game. Sorry, when preserving a miniatures game. So I'm getting to work on preserving my Guild Ball Butchers versus Fishermen experience, frozen in time, Guild Ball board game capsule and uh, I'm gonna have a blast while doing it. I'll keep you updated. Maybe they'll turn into a video down the road, but I just wanted to kick this idea out there, get you guys thinking, discussing, leave in the comments, like if you have any experience with this type of thing, if you've seen this type of thing, if you think it's successful, um, what games do you think already do this pretty well? You know, let's, let's have some great conversation in the comments as we always do. Uh, please like and subscribe, join the Discord, join the Patreon if you would like to, and we'll see you next time. I am ready to subscribe again.